my name is Lou D'Andrea. Um, I'll be talking about the manipulate function this afternoon. So the first, the first half of the talk, I'm going to be covering you know, what, the, what the options are for the primitives layer and for the manipulate layer to improve behavior in various circumstances. Um, I call that synchronicity. Second half of the talk, I'm going to be covering some of the lesser known, lesser documented, undocumented syntaxes of uh, various manipulate things. OK, so what happens when manipulate gets bogged down? That's the first thing I'd like to talk about. How do you avoid the case where you have you know, a, a content of a manipulate? It takes, in this case, an artificially long time. Um, but you might have some you know, interesting computation going on here. You try to evaluate this. The content goes off and says, I, I want to be updated. And the, the front end says, ah, but you're in a dynamic, so you can't, you can't wait too long to finish up. And you wind up in a situation where you're not seeing the, the result. You know, or there might be other places in the manipulate where you have a long-running evaluation, and exactly what happens as a result of this being interrupted is sometimes difficult to see. Um, and you might have, likewise, you might have you know a, a long-running computation to set up the endpoints of one of your controls. So here we have um, here we have a pause in in the computation that creates the control. So is this the control we think it is? And I'm not going to evaluate this last one, but it's more of the same. So, so how, do we, how do we deal with this situation? Well, manipulate is built up of a layer of dynamic primitives in the front end. So first I'm going to talk about how we handle this, uh, these situations in general in that primitives layer, and then talk about how manipulate leverages those primitives. So there's two basic, you know, back in version, let's see, when was manipulate invented? Back in version 5 of Mathematica, there was a single math link between the front end and kernel. All of the communication between the front end and kernel happened on one link. And it happened in a, in a queue. You know, you shift return, a bunch of cells there, first in, first out, etc. Um, with the advent of dynamic interfaces, we have the case where we might have a long running evaluation happening on the main queue. So notice cell bracket is highlighted. This is while true. It's never going to return. And yet this manipulate is still responsive. And it's going off to the kernel to calculate the zeta function at various points. How is it doing this? It's communicating with the kernel on different links. So there are, starting in version 6, there are three links between the front end and kernel. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about those links. It suffices for the purposes of this talk to know they exist. And we're going to talk about how to target certain evaluations to happen in certain ways um, on these links. So some links, the, there's the main link, which is, which is what I'm calling here the asynchronous case. And then there's the, the, the link that's intended to be used by the interface elements, which is the, the synchronous case. So, so I, I split these into two. There's a third link that's a service link that we're not going to talk about today. Um, so, so the two main categories of evaluations here are those that are supposed to be fast, are supported you know, by direct manipulation kinds of things. You, you move a slider, you immediately get a response. Um, that's, the best mo that's the best way to handle fast running evaluations and interfaces. There's no blinking indication on the cell bracket. There's no running in the title bar. Um, the, one of the drawbacks of this is that the front end waits while that is happening. It, the front end is treating that like an internal process. And it's thinking, I need to finish this process before giving control back to the user. So everything halts while the front end is waiting for the kernel to respond to these preemptive tasks. And as a result, we don't want to hang the user system. So after a few seconds of waiting, we, we have, I think there's a six second timeout by default. Um, so after six seconds, such evaluations time out. This is the default mode for dynamic. This is one of the default modes for manipulate. Um, and it's the d default mode for initializations that happen in dynamic module. As, and contrast that with the kinds of evaluations that happen as a result of shift return that can run for days. You know, these are the things that you've, that you've enjoyed since version one of Mathematica. Um, has anybody, how many, can I see a show of hands for people in here who have used version one of Mathematica? That always amazes me. Okay. Um, I, I, I myself didn't didn't start using it until version two something, but um, so so right. I mean, this these these are this is the same old you know first in first out queue. Um, so how do we access the long running state from these other state from these other places that want to be fast and responsive to the user? Well, in the the primitive that we call dynamic, which is the wrapper that you put around something when you always want to know its current value, we have an option uh, synchronous updating. By default, I mentioned the default 
synchronous synchronicity for dynamic is true. So after a few seconds, it's going to time out. We see dollar boarded here. Um, if instead this is handled as an asynchronous evaluation, we have a placeholder for when this content is going to come back in in a few seconds. So the front end moves on to accept other interface input, um, leaves a space for where it's going to fill in stuff later. So synchronous updating is the way to, to tell dynamic, don't bog down everything. Go off and do what you have to do. Come back when you're ready to show me something. Okay, so there's also the initialization option to manipulate, which is implemented by the initialization option to dynamic module internally. Um, and if you have, so here we have an artificially long running evaluation that happens the first time this thing is displayed in the, in the front end. And so here we're in, we're in, this initialization is being evaluated synchronously. The front end is, everything's halted, waiting for the result. Notice that we didn't get x equals 1. The, the end of this initialization didn't actually evaluate. Um, and we got no indication that it aborted. Manipulate gives you an indication. Dynamic module is the primitive, and it doesn't. How do we handle such a situation? Well, there's analogous to the synchronous updating option of dynamic, there is a synchronous initialization option to dynamic module. So this dynamic, the first dynamic evaluates immediately, shows the current value of x. Notice the cell bracket is highlighted, the initialization is running, and when it finishes, the value updates. So if you have a, if you have a one time operation that takes a long time, placing it into a synchronous, uh, an asynchronous initialization may be the way to go. Okay, there are a few controls that are aware of this difference between the different, uh, the different links. We have uh, method options for button and for action menu. These are the two control primitives that are, likely, are most likely to spawn long-running computations. So they each have a method option, which by default uses the preemptive link, the responsive, you know, intended to be fast link. But you can switch it to the other, to the other mode by setting uh, method arrow queued. So this is often what you want to use when you're building buttons that launch interfaces that users have to interact with. Because users tend to take their time when they interact with the file open dialog, and that's fine. They can take as long as they want. Um, but a button with a six second timeout on the function is not going to do that particular application any good. Um, so for instance, file name setter doesn't even have a method option. File name setter is the control that presents a button for, for um, for choosing a file, it it, it opens a, a, a you know a, a file chooser, and that button is coded in top-level Mathematica with no ability to change the method because it, it's always the right thing to set method queued for um, for buttons that create interfaces. That 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 that, that uh, block in the kernel. Okay, what you can't see here is there's a bonus section at the bottom of this slide, which I'm not opening any of the bonus sections. Okay. So how do these primitive, these options in the primitives layer, dynamic and dynamic module, how does that map to manipulate? Um, well, manipulate also takes synchronous updating and synchronous initialization. The synchronous updating setting is passed to the dynamic that's implicitly wrapped around the first argument to manipulate when its boxes are built. And the synchronous initialization is implicitly passed to the dynamic module that's used to store the values of all of the manipulate goodness in your notebook. Um, and it, here's just, a, a, you know, by now this should, this should make a little bit of sense. If you have a fast running evaluation, then synchronous updating true is probably what you want. If you have something that's going to take a while in the content area of your manipulate, you might want to set synchronous updating to false. I'm going to talk about the automatic case in a second. And likewise for the initialization. So let's look at, very briefly, at examples of these. So here we have a long running evaluation and synchronous initialization set to false so that it can so that it complete on time. Manipulate actually has an additional little nice, you know, user interface type barber pole thing on on a different platform. It's the appropriate uh, indeterminate progress indicator saying I'm busy, come back and see me later. And here we see that the initialization successfully completed. Um, and likewise for synchronous updating, um, another thing that you might need so so there's a question there, there's there's a fine line to be walked here right there there are computations that take a long time and you can develop user interface thingies that that make it nice and so that the user feels all warm and fuzzy while they're waiting but there's a real question about whether such 
computations belong in an interface like Manipulate. Maybe they, maybe they, they should be designed in some other kind of interface. And we have a rich dynamic layer um, th th that you can design your own things. Yes? Is there an approach where you can produce a low fidelity representation while you are moving a slider ah. and then converge to a high fidelity? The, the, the question is, is there a way while you're moving a slider to not render the beautiful thing, but to render a fast, a fast rendering of something and then switch and then switch to the to the other mode. This is not a plant, by the way, but but my next point okay, is is uh, a primitive called control active, um, where you can do exactly that. So control active is a primitive where you have it, it takes two arguments. The first argument is an expression that generates a nice fast draft rendering of something. The second argument is the thing that generates a beautiful rendering of something. It switches between the two. Of course, the beautiful rendering might want to take longer than six seconds. So how do we remedy this in, in Manipulate? Well, Manipulate doesn't have the same default for synchronous updating that Dynamic has. Dynamic has a default synchronous updating true. So Dynamic expects all of its, unless you, unless you specify otherwise, it expects all of its updates to happen immediately. Manipulate has the default synchronous updating automatic, which means at the front end's discretion, it can send these things on the preemptive link or on the queued link. And so when these uh, let's show an example of this. Control active actually working, so you can get us. So while I'm dragging the slider, I'm seeing just the number value, you know, the, some representation, some minimal representation. I let go of the slider, call this longer running function, creates a, creates a sound wave. Um, so the, so the, the fast, the, the, the first argument to external active is being updated. Notice while I was dragging here, the cell bracket's not highlighting. This is, this is updating, you know, the front end is saying, perform these updates synchronously. I let go, the front end says, okay, now this evaluation might take a while. Perform this update asynchronously. Um, some of you may have seen this without even knowing it uh, by looking at plot 3D. Let me evaluate that again and pay special attention to what happens when this first starts showing up. I'll do it once more. So notice the first thing you see is a sort of jaggedy, and it doesn't quite look like the beautiful, smooth plot 3D. It looks like this sort of spiky torture device, I don't know. Um, and, then, and then a, a split second later, it snaps to the, beautiful, to the beautiful rendering. And the way this is implemented internally is plot 3D has a performance goal option whose default setting depends on control active. So when you drop a plot 3D into a manipulate, control active is automatically bank switching things like the mesh option and the plot points option, and it's automatically giving you a fast rendering. Of course, you can use control active yourself at the, at, you know, if you're, if you're willing to drop down to the primitives level, you could, you could do arbitrary, you know, you could, you could bank switch other option settings, you could have something that's a plot on drag and, and a plot 3D when you release, et cetera. Um, but the point is, that, um, that, that, we have, that we have these primitives for you to work with, and they work beautifully and seamlessly in Manipulate without you even knowing to, needing to know that they're there. Okay, so that's synchronicity. Um, so a couple of things that I haven't spoken before about um, are different sizing considerations. Uh, how many, I'm curious to know how many people here have submitted demonstrations to the demonstrations project? Okay, this is, this is one particular idiomatic form of, of using Manipulate. And the, dynamics pro the, the demonstrations project has its own sort of requirements for the sizing of, of things. I want to give you more flexible sizing abilities here. I want to show you what Manipulate's capable of if, if you break it free from the shackles of the demonstrations project. Right? So here, here we have stacks of controls. This is what you're used to seeing in Manipulate. You have big stacks of controls. Isn't this lovely? Well, it's useful, but sometimes you want things to be a little bit more beautiful than this. And a careful reading of the Manipulate homepage will say, well, you can have not only controls, but you can, you can intersperse them with annotations. I won't go through all the annotations, but I'll show a couple of them here. So here is the same five controls, but instead of a big stack of five of them, or 20 of them, or 100 of them, they're broken up into a tab, into a tab view in this case. Tab view is another Mathematica primitive for intended to build user interfaces. Um, and with a little bit of extra syntactic sugar, the control wrapper, um, we have now the same interface, uh, but whose controls are laid out in a much more compact form. 
mean, there, there, are, there are lots of other annotations we could rely on. I wanted to show something where we're programmatically building a manipulate with lots of controls. So here's, here's some code that builds a manipulate uh, with 10 controls, just in a column on the left, numbers them, whatever, not very interesting. But what if this, instead of 10, were 100, 200, 300? Well, I'm not sure that an interface with 300 controls is all that useful, but let's look at the 100 case at least. So here, the only difference between uh, this input, I'm going to delete this output so we can see them both on the screen at the same time. The main difference here is that around the, uh, the control block, I'm wrapping some other, some other user interface constructs. This frame, pane, column. I'm constructing a scrolling frame in which to display a hundred this time controls. It takes a little while for to, to display this. And now we have in this pane that fits entirely on my tiny little 1200 by whatever uh, projector screen, but it displays literally a hundred sliders um, that you can scroll through and you know they're all here's number 40, here's 43, etc. Um, so, so you know, there's there's all sorts of ways that you can that you can sort of wrap up these controls in in useful layouts that isn't just column on the top, column on the left, etc. Okay, and and I have one other uh, example here just because people ask constantly about how do I write a manipulate with a variable number of controls. So here is a manipulate that takes you know it's it's, an, it's a list of 200 integers that are zero or one gives you an interface for, for changing them, but it only displays as much of that interface as you want to display. And so, you know, I want, let's say I want only the first 20 of these guys displayed. So here I have the first 20 and I can change them. And now I'm ready to move to the full 200. So other ideas, you know, this is using, this is using the annotation form. This particular annotation is wrapped in a dynamic and that dynamic generates a bunch of other controls. Okay. So that's sizing in the control area. We also have the ability to size in the content area, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, we have, uh, so here's, here's a manipulate that takes lots of space, much larger than, than I have for the screen. Um, we have a, uh, a version of that. So we implemented an option that's kind of a strange name, shrinking delay. So shrinking delay, when set, uh, allows the manipulate content area to get larger, but not smaller, at least not immediately. So you're not constantly changing the size of the footprint of these things in your notebook and your content isn't all moving around the manipulate. So it gets larger to a point and then, and then stops getting larger. And then after a second or so, we'll snap back around the small, small version. Animate sets this by default, for instance. Um, but you can also set the content size area of Manipulate, which effectively wraps a pane around your content. Um, you can set it to be a fixed width so that you get you know, uh, infinite height, but a fixed width. I should say arbitrary height. Um, you can set a range of widths. You can set uh, fixed width and height, in which case, oop, that's the wrong one. Fixed width and height, in which case, if it spills over that size, you notice the scroll bar appearing automatically so that users can get to all your content. Um, and the last thing I want to say is there's a very useful size for content, there's a very useful setting for content size, full, which allows the content area to expand to fill the non-control width of the, of the notebook. What I mean by that is now this manipulate will take as much width as you can give it. If I were to shrink the notebook, the width of this manipulate overall would shrink. Um, of course, I'll move it up. So, so the width of this, of this manipulate is shrinking. Um, the beauty of this is that without content size full or a fixed content size, you can't put controls on the right-hand side and have them stay under your mouse while you're moving. If you, if you have controls on the right and you move the mouse and the result of changing that value changes the size of your expression, the, the manipulate shrinks around it and the control moves. And luckily, the slider remembers sort of where the mouse was and where it was and continues the right, you know, it does the right thing, but in the wrong place. So this is a way to avoid that situation. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. The, uh, the notebook is available. Uh, thank you for your time, and we have time for questions.